Well, good morning. Um, it's great to be here, and uh, thank you for giving a plug to that special report on The Economist. It was actually up on the website, economist.com, and the uh, title of the report is uh, The Great Mismatch, um, which was really what struck me as I went around trying to put that together was the extent to which there is probably unprecedented change going on in the world of work at the moment that um, it's been much predicted, but only recently, I think, has it started to... The, the sort of changes that people have been talking about for 20 or 30 years have really started to happen and to accelerate. And partly the financial crisis and global recession has accelerated that, but also technology trends, uh, social media, all the sorts of things that um, are part and parcel of everyday life now have, have added to that. And I think that it is already creating a, a major disruption for many traditional businesses. Um, and it's clearly going to create major challenges for how we run societies, for what people can reasonably expect uh, out of their working lives. Um, and it's absolutely clear that our political leaders do not have a clue what's going on in this world. Um, I was at a meeting, a dinner last night, where uh, Alice Rivlin, who's a sort of veteran economist, um, former Fed governor, was talking with Glenn Hubbard, who's the head of the Columbia Business School, and uh, an advisor to Mitt Romney um, on economics, uh, so the less wacky parts. But um, they basically agreed that the, the political world in Washington just hasn't got a clue what's going on in the labor market at the moment, and very different sorts of thinking is going to be required, whether from government or from civil society and, and business, to solve some of the big challenges of unemployment and underemployment. So, um, uh, you know, the special report was called The Great Mismatch because it, it um, for me, uh, sort of came home to me that, that, that basically this is a period that if you have the right skills and the right mindset, and the right networks, this is probably the best it's ever been for you as you think about how do you live your life and get the work balance uh, that you want. But if you don't have the right skills, networks, or um, mindset, you know, the world is going to get quite a lot more difficult. And, uh, and there's also this sort of sense that the people that have the skills, the networks, and the ideas aren't necessarily talking to the people that have the jobs. And so there's all sorts of things going on that need to be uh, aligned. Um, and to talk about the sort of issues that this new world of work is throwing up, we have a great panel, I think, people, five people who are in different ways running organizations that are absolutely at the cutting edge of dealing with this dramatic transformation. Um, to my immediate uh, right is Gary Swart, who I actually uh, write a bit about his organization, Odesk, in my special report because it's, a, as he'll explain, as a marketplace connecting uh, freelancers all around the world. Um, then we have uh, Benjamin Pyatt, who uh, runs Grind, which he'll tell you about. Um, then John Windsor, um, who's uh, written many books on this subject as well as uh, running a, a sort of a, an agency uh, designed to disrupt a whole industry, which he'll tell you about. Then we have Sarah Horowitz, who runs the Freelancers Union, which um, is, the, I think, probably the fastest growing union in America, but by doing everything differently to what a traditional union would do. And then lastly, we have uh, Jeff Leventhal, who's a serial entrepreneur in this space of uh, evolving labor markets. And um, I'm going to start, actually, with Gary, and go, we'll just go quickly down the, the line and get three or four minutes from each person on you know, what their organization actually does and, and what the particular challenge it is that um, the organization is designed to solve or is grappling with, however you want to look at it. Gary, let's start with you. Sure. So my name is Gary Swart. I'm the CEO of Odesk. And Odesk is the world's largest online workplace. We enable companies to hire manage and pay a flexible online workforce. So as Matthew mentioned, you know, the world of work is changing. Often the workers with skills don't live where the jobs exist and vice versa, right? So what we're doing is we're, we're capitalizing on the internet and globalization and this 
uh, tailwind of the economy is helping to fuel this opportunity to bring the work to the worker as opposed to the worker to the work. So we've created a network of 1.6 million contractors around the world. Uh, these people are online, they're available, ready, willing, and able to work for over 300,000 customers, mostly small businesses, who are trying to get work done. They can't compete with the big companies in their local geography. They're hiring people through our network to do that work remotely. So if you think about e-commerce, early days of e-commerce when people wouldn't even consider buying a car or a Rolex online, they were buying a book or a Beanie Baby. Um, but e-commerce was about finding the right good, getting delivery of that good, and paying for that good. We believe that e-work should follow that exact same paradigm. Find the right worker, regardless of where they live in the world. If they're not within a 50 mile radius, you should have access to them anyway because of the internet. Get delivery of the work. How do you know that you're gonna get what you pay for if the person is commuting from Russia or from Ohio or from India or wherever they may be in the world? And then how do you pay for that work legally, globally, right? What about the statutory requirements? What about moving money? And how do you transfer the funds? So find the right worker, get delivery of the work, and pay for the work all via the internet. Uh, that's what our business is doing. Hi, Benjamin. Hi, I'm Benjamin Diet. I'm co-founder of Grind. Uh, Grind. Sorry. It's, it's good. Grind is a collaborative workspace. <clears throat> um, we don't like to call ourselves a co-working space because we're more than that. Uh, co-working space is more of a real estate play while uh, what we do at Grind is more about building a community and a, a network that freelancers and creative people and consultants and small teams of people like that, we like to call them free radicals, um, can work and pull from. Uh, we give them a home and a home base. You know, I'm often asked uh, how I view Grind's role in the future of work. And uh, one of my co-panelists here today, Sarah Horowitz, did an interview in uh, The Atlantic not long ago where she described the surge in freelance as the industrial revolution of our time. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with her more. Um, and Grind's role in that revolution is, is to house the troops. Um, but we don't only house them, we actually give them a uh, support system and supply lines to go out and fight every day. Um, our job is to take the mundane things that surround having a place to work and take those off your plate and let you just focus on doing the best work you can and getting it done and pulling from other people and other resources that we provide in the room. Um, it's a living, breathing organism, Grind, and uh, it's a wonderful experience. Thanks. Hi, right, John. I'm John Windsor, and I'm the CEO of Victors and Spoils. Um, it's an ad agency built on crowdsourcing principles. Uh, one of the things we're trying to figure out is, we, well, we believe in crowdsourcing. We also believe that, that a lot of our clients, uh, Unilever and General Mills and Harley Davidson, um, aren't ready to actually accept ideas from these mass uh, platforms. That the idea that there still needs to be a curation layer or a, or a creative uh, direction layer, or a strategic direction layer. So, the way we've we've designed ourselves, we have a we've gone from I guess last year we were seven folks, now we're 24 folks in the office uh, with a network of 6,000 folks. Um, it, it's really interesting watching the business grow from a revenue per employee. We're, we're doing about four times the industry average. So really lots of leverage there. One of the things that we see from our crowd that we find really interesting, we, we just had uh, the first person passed 1,000 entries into our system. Um, he's won $150,000. Um, so it, he's won a lot, of, a lot of not only public projects, but also private projects. I would say 25% of our, our process is a public briefs that you see on our, our site that people can participate in. But 75% are private uh, briefs that we actually launch to the people we select. So we're selecting the right folks for the right projects, whether it's a global uh, social media strategy project or producing you know, TV. Um, then we take those ideas with the client and actually form those into the right kinds of executions and then actually produce the work. So we feel like most of our clients aren't ready to actually 
they don't have the tools and the skills internally to, to be able to curate that work themselves. Um, we feel like the next phase, we just created a thing called Fan Machine on Facebook, a social media platform that allows, uh, sorry, a, a, a social, a Fan Machine is social media you know, software that, that allows fans to create their own, um, their own executions of ideas. So um, it's a piece of software that allows our clients, Holly Davidson and next week Converse will launch it, um, to be able to put up their own briefs for advertising and product innovation, actually disintermediate people like ourselves, even any agency. So uh, fans can launch in uh, and put up ideas, and then ideas can be voted on, moderated by our crew of uh, 6,000 uh, people in our agency machine platform. Um, ideas then go back out onto Facebook and can be voted on by other fans. One of the things we're, we're finding, well, actually next week you'll see the first television spot produced from the fan machine that we produced for Harley Davidson. Um, and what, one of the things we're finding is fans really want to participate. I think Rashad talked, uh, talked about it really well and I think that's one of the things that I find really interesting is how do you give your brand over to your fans, over to your customers and allow them to create their own momentum for the brand to take it forward, whether it's Lego or Holly Davidson, those passionate brands I think have a real advantage to do that. Great, Sarah. So I've been trying to think about you know how to how to talk about the freelancers union, and I think the best way to start is to take a really long and ponderous review of the period of 1820 to 1880. Do you think that's a good idea? <laughs> and um, you agree with that. Because what's interesting is that we are in the third industrial revolution. The first one in the 1800s was where we started having big factories and we started seeing a huge transformation where people were leaving family farms. And the second huge transformation was in the last century for mass production. But what I think is so interesting about looking back, and, and if, okay, so therefore we are in the third transformation, but you get that point because that's why you are here. So why do I think the 1820s and 1880s, that period has been really overlooked? I think that is the model in terms of what's happening to the zeitgeist of, of our era, that what happened then was people started seeing these massive changes that felt so much bigger than they are and were, and they couldn't imagine how could we possibly have a say in how to make this fit the way I want to live my life. And so you started seeing a lot of interesting and kind of somewhat crazy movements, the utopian movement, the transcendental movement. I recommend looking these all up because they're really wild. You'd think they were from the 1960s, but no, people were doing that in the 1840s. And the major labor organization of the time was called Knights of Labor. You should Google that, because like, it hasn't been Googled by more than 10 people in about 15 years. And um, not that Google was Googling 15 years, but you get the point. And so what happened was that that labor organization said the most important thing for working people would be that we should start forming cooperatives. People started coming together to solve their own problems, but they didn't have an internet. So what they were doing was coming together very locally and start starting to form different kinds of organization. Like you could imagine, it looks a lot like the, what people are doing in Bushwick, you know, and Greenpoint and, um, and parts of Texas and California. And so as I'm telling you this, it's like, well, why am I telling you this from the freelancers union? Because our goal is to start figuring out ways that we can look at how technology can enable people to come together to start, start solving their own problems. That if there's one thing we know that's going to be completely different about the way that we're organizing ourselves, and you've already heard it from this panel, is people don't want us or you or anybody to tell them how to organize. They very much want to do this themselves, but want some curation or facilitation, want to be able to know that there are ways that they can come together, and then that there's something larger going on here. And I would say it's a real, another real transformation from the I to the we, and recognizing that we are individuals, but we must be a summation of individuals. We are connected, we're interconnected, and that we have to start doing this for common purpose. And that's what I think is going to be really important is that we're now going to realize that to be blunt, business has set this agenda. Business set the agenda for the first industrial revolution. Business set the agenda for the second industrial revolution. And business is setting this agenda, figuring out how work needs to be structured because that's the job of business. You amass capital, you have a structure and a strategy. 
And so our job is to start bringing together workers to start saying, how are we going to reform this in terms of making this fair, making this an economic democracy, but doing it like creatively and interestingly and something that could actually work. Great. We'll discuss more of that later as well. Okay. The last year, Jeff. Jeff. <clears throat> um, work market is a uh, platform where companies come to manage large contingents of contract labor. Essentially, what we've done is we've taken what we consider the labor process of finding people, verifying them, engaging them, managing them, paying them, and rating them. We've encapsulated that into a software platform where um, our clients, mostly enterprises, manage thousands of contract workers that they may need on demand. They're not always sure where or when they'll need these people, and they manage a one-to-many relationship um, through our platform. Um, clients that use us usually will spend in the millions of dollars per year um, in labor expenses to these people, and uh, they'll curate these teams of labor in our marketplace um, so that they've got the right people on board when and where they may need them in the future. So a little more enterprise oriented than small business. Um, strategic labor, R&D scientists, um, technology workers. Uh, so um, a marketplace, high-end labor, enterprises, and they're doing it today. Great. So I want to start, I mean, I'll start with you, Gary. Um, the, Let's, let's try and sketch out the big picture of where this is all heading. If you, so your vision at, at Odesk, what, what's the labor market going to look like in 10 or 15 years' time if things play out as you expect, you know, for people here in America but for people around the world? Yeah, so as we said earlier, the jobs don't exist typically where the talent lives. And because of technology, uh, that's no longer the case. You can get access to talent wherever it lives in the world. Um, and maybe the way I'll, I'll paint the picture is by talking about our own company. We're in Redwood City, California. We're 75 employees uh, today. And we leverage our own network to augment our staff. So we have about 225 full-time equivalent contractors that come to work for us every day from wherever they are in the world. So if you think about it, we're three to one contractors to employees. So who are these contractors? Well, these are software developers and QA professionals that live around the world. We have about 120 um, individual contractors. They're not co-located under one roof anywhere. They're living in Omsk, they're living in Ukraine, they're living in Poland, they're living in India. Uh, we have about 50 support professionals that are mostly living in the Philippines, managed by a stay-at-home mom in Texas and in Tennessee. Right? And so I've seen the stay-at-home mom from Texas once in the last two years. So we're, we're leveraging the, the, the virtual workforce in order to get work done. And the cost savings for us as a business are phenomenal. It's probably about five or six to one. And the benefits to the workers are also phenomenal. The stay-at-home uh, moms in the Philippines uh, one of them, a, a lot of them are former registered nurses. A registered nurse in the Philippines makes a dollar an hour. On ODES, they're making five dollars an hour. So they're making five times their daily wage. Uh, it has nothing to do with nursing, but they would rather work for our company uh, from the Philippines because they can make more money, the work is more rewarding. And by the way, they can't even get jobs because there's a dearth of nurses in the Philippines since the U.S. cut off visas. So if you just play that forward and you say we're three to one today, let's just assume that the world is slower to catch up. But by 2020, uh, everybody's figuring out what percentage of their work can be done remotely. So let's say that it's the inverse. Maybe for every three employees you have one contractor. Or how about 2% out of every 100 workers, is it conceivable, believable, expected, accepted that two out of every 100 workers could in fact be remote? And maybe it's two full-time equivalents. Maybe it's 10 people that work the equivalency of, of, uh, of two remote people. And if you were to say that, that is a massive, massive market. Right? So we believe that e-work is going to look like e-commerce. Not all goods are bought online, but a lot are, and there's a lot more today than there were 10 years ago. So if we play the tapes forward eight years and say, okay, what does e-work look like? Uh, assume it's, um, uh, it's 2%. And if you take all of e-commerce today, less than 10% of goods are bought online versus on-premise. Less than 10%. And it's still a massive, massive market, and the world of work is even bigger. So that's where we think it's going. I suppose, you know, as with e-commerce, you know, even though a lot of the transactions will remain offline, the price will be set by the online transaction in a sense. So if you're 
even if you keep your existing workers mostly on staff, you're probably paying them less. Is that right? Uh, that's exactly right. Well, it's, it's global arbitrage. I mean, the price is going to be determined based on supply and demand and based on your skill. So if you go to our website, odesk.com, and you go to the economy section, uh, you know, we have, we're transacting almost $30 million a month in work uh, as of today. And there's a lot of just fantastic statistics about skills and quality and regions and rates. And you can see that the world truly is flat. And uh, you can go determine the price of a PHP programmer in Russia or India or the US. In the US, you're going to pay more, but you're not going to have to deal with time zone differences or language challenges. And we're saying, look, the buyer should determine the value, as should the contractor. People should be able to determine who they want to work with, when they want to work, and how much they want to charge for the work that they're, uh, that they're about, and, and similarly for the buyers. So this world is truly flat because of the internet. And one more question before I throw it over to the rest of the panel. Um, you, know, you talk about 2%, 2 out of 100 full-time equivalent jobs, maybe by 2020, if that were to happen, that would be massive change. And I suppose the question I have is, you know, you're a you know, very technologically based business. You know, a lot of it is relatively easy for you to outsource work via the internet. To what extent is that two out of a hundred what you expect uh, across the board in all sorts of other industries, you know, which are maybe less ready to to adapt? Or do, do you think two, two out of a hundred is going to be on the low side? I think it's going to be on the low side. So we actually think that we'll transact $10 billion worth of work through Odesk's platform alone in the year 2020. Our business is doubling uh, in each of the last four years. We'll double again this year. And even if the trend slows, uh, you know, it's really easy to see how we could get to 10 billion by 2020. Um, and we're just going after online work, right? We're just going, um, we're just focused on work that can be done via the internet. There's lots of platforms like Odesk that are focused on premise. Jeff uh, Leventhal at the end started one of those companies called OnForce and it was about on-site IT repair. Uh, but it's a marketplace, it's a network business, it's, it's, uh, it's about freelancer, it's about virtual workers and so we're just, I'm just talking about one segment of it, which is work that's done online. Today, mostly technical work, but aggressively getting pulled into um, you know, QA, documentation and tech writing, content creation, translation, marketing, managerial, accounting, legal, finance, any job that can be done in front of the computer. And just one other quick example, and I always use this one, but if you think about eBay, they started with Beanie Babies and Pez dispensers, and then collectibles, and then one day somebody said, why not a Rolex? And then why not a car? And if you think back to early eBay, you never would have believed that you'd buy a car. And you may look at e-work platforms today and say, oh, there's no way I would get a lawyer this way, or there's no way I'd get a strategic consultant. Well, guess what? I believe that you will, right? If you believe that the world of work will uh, revolutionize like the world of e-commerce did, then, uh, then it's, it's believable. Now, uh, the, any panelists have any significant disagreements with that kind of vision for how the labor market might evolve over the next 10 or 10 years or so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that I think that's totally true in one segment of the economy. But I think that there's something that's brewing out there that people are starting to come together and say, hey, you know, why should we be competing all across the world when we can come together and form some of our own organization and get the benefit of our own profit and maybe actually work in a co co-creative space and uh, collaborative space. Uh, Co-working and collaborative spaces are, are coming up all over the country really, really fast because people actually want to have a face-to-face -face connection to one another. And I think you're going to start seeing really interesting new forms of organization. We see the B Corps that are coming up where people are saying we need four benefit corporations. And um, you know it may not look like an old co a cooperative or something that feels like of another era, but people People are going to be coming up with new forms because, frankly, it's really just not that interesting to be making five dollars an hour. I don't know about you, but I don't know how you go out and you know have a vacation on that kind of salary. Perhaps if you live in the developing world, that's really pretty amazing. But I think that's kind of a hard sell for Americans. Right, and I mean that's a, and I, mean, I don't know, I mean, Jeff. I mean, is this good for Americans? I mean, this this transition, or are Americans going to really have to so, get used to becoming? Competitive with developing countries. Yeah, our marketplace is um, run in America, and 
what we see happening is that people who maybe weren't getting work or getting work as efficiently are now getting more work in the contingent world, world, work spend. And so we see an uh, enormous amount of benefits to these contract workers. And the other thing that we see happening in our marketplace is that our clients, most interestingly, will take their W-2 workers and manage them in our marketplace alongside with our contractors. Keeping W-2s is sometimes hard to justify, but what they can do in our marketplace is they can So take W-2s, just for those who don't full, know that. Full-time employees, right. uh, full-time equivalents. They'll take those W-2s and what they'll do is they'll monetize them in our marketplace. And so they'll say, well, this, these workers aren't busy next week, and so we'll just check them off and we'll make them available in the work market general marketplace. And so now we can keep these people and we can also further monetize them in our system. It does a couple of things for us. One, it makes our supply really interesting to people who are looking for good contractors. Great W-2 workers from world-class organizations are the kind of people other people want to hire. And so one, we're driving more full-time employment in that respect by bringing up the capacity and the utilization of full-time staff, but we're also letting companies fill the peak of the labor demand with our contingent workflow uh, marketplace. But in a sense that your talent is mostly based in America though, is it? Our, market, so our company was launched seven months ago. Today we're in America and we'll launch internationally you know, as demand requires. Canada will be turned on in a few months. But today our business is in America. Um, I'd like to add one thing to what Sarah was saying is that in our marketplace also our clients will curate groups of talent and they'll say, well these are the kind of people we want to work for us in these areas and they can form 15 or 20 different groups at a time. Interestingly enough, the supply base said to us, well, we want to form our own groups and we want to organize ourselves. And then they, what they're doing is they're curating their own pool and saying, hey, we're the best scientists to engage for this kind of work. So just instead of the buy side of the labor saying, hey, I want to go, I'm, I'm going to put my people here, I'm going to curate them, the people have now said, I want to form my own group and I want to let people know that this is the best group to get this kind of help in. And they're self-policing themselves and saying, if you want to remain in this group that has a lot of work flowing through it, you're going to do a really good job. And so we see this organization happening in our marketplace. Benjamin, you wanted to come in. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I come from a slightly different perspective because I, I sit in a room with a lot of these remote workers every day. And um, I mean, we're all here at this conference because we're, you know, we're on the cusp of a massive change in business. And um, what makes up what we call a company is, is changing quickly. Um, you know, the old school was to have a, a static W-2 workforce and uh, build the best one you can and hope that uh, they'll be effective over a wide range of, of future pro possible projects. Um, what, what we see at Grind um, is a little bit of the opposite, which is uh, pools of people who are there because <coughs> they are really the spokes of a, of a custom wheel that can be put together to, to solve specific problems and tasks. Um, and companies uh, that we're involved with that are, are hiring a lot of our workers um, are now made up of small core teams that pull in these, these special workers as and when they need them. Um, and there is a lot of accountability and transparency that is associated with this new style of working. Uh, because especially if uh, people are collaborating in our space on particular projects, um, at, at the end of that project, the next day, they still have to sit next to that person. Great. Um, John? Uh, it, one of the things I think that's been so, so magical about about technology in the last 10 years. I, I used to be in the magazine publishing business and what allowed me to go into that business, I published a magazine called Women's Sports and Fitness. It was economically infeasible for me to have a staff of journalists. With Women's Sports and Fitness, I, I, what I focused on is the, actually the curation level, you know, layer. I, I hired really good editors, but if I was gonna have a woman talk about a first person experience of climbing Everest, I couldn't have that same woman talk about swimming in the English Channel. So I needed to use real authentic people out there doing things and then really have this curation layer that actually you know, developed things. From that, you know, and, and one of the things, I, I, my background's in, in climbing and, and skiing, and a lot of my friends started at that level, John Krakauer, Dave Roberts, and they worked their way up, become very famous writers, became that kind of curation lo layer themselves. Um, my sense is the same thing's happening in, in, our, in our little world, where we started with people who were executing projects, now we have 
projects, we're, we're in three pitches right now where it's a fully aggregated crowd team where we have people that are former ECDs from big agencies that don't want to do that anymore, that lead projects. They, they recruit their own teams to put together the right team for a pitch. So we're, we're allowing that just to happen. So it's not just the execution at a lower level, it's more the collaboration and co-creation and teams selecting themselves. All the time we get calls that say, hey, I'm working on this project, I'm really psyched, but can I have my friend, or I really like the way this, this, this person could add a lot of value to what I, my idea is. And we're always open for that. Um, the idea that more, more minds, and we, we feel like great ideas come from everywhere, but it's really the, the combination of the great idea coming from everywhere and then making sure that it's applied strategically and creatively to a brand to make sure that it solves a business problem. So I mean, it's as, you, as you look at your, your crowd that you're sourcing from, right. I mean, is, is it your sense that people in that crowd are, are making a full-time living in that world? They're or? just starting to. I, I, you know, but, but half of our crowd actually works in the industry, and I think mm -hmm. that's something that's, that's really interesting. You know, my sense... So they're getting kind of bonus work, essentially. Yeah, I, I think that in, in any, you know, we as businesses, we, we act how we're compensated, right? And so in, in the agency world, people are compensated mainly, and it's evolving, but mainly on an on a FTE basis, a full-time full employee basis, hourly charging clients on an on hourly basis. So if you're a, a TV script creative or a TV creative in New York, you really, you know, the, the company maximizes its revenue by making sure you stay focused on what you're really good at. When you know as a creative that really soon, you know, there's lots of other kind of creative outlets. There's social media, there's, there's product innovation and design, there's, uh, there's all the digital work, and you need to have those skills in those other areas. Well, it, it's just hard to train those folks, so we feel like we're a place that people can come to lean in to do new, do new kinds of projects and, and get experience. So. And Jeff, is that the same with your workforce, or, or do you think, I mean, how many of those are full-time working for you and how many are doing stuff on the side? For so anecdotally, people do make a full-time living in our marketplace, um, but I would say statistically, most of the people are supplementing other forms of income. And uh, Gary? Uh, <clears throat> we're seeing more and more full-timeness in the network. I know, uh, you know, being in the New York area, there's a woman in the New York area at $125 an hour. She made 40 grand last year, so not quite full-time, but she's also a mom, so the ability to have that flex schedule uh, and be able to, to work when she wants. But, uh, you know, similarly, we have folks in Russia, $33 an hour. Uh, one individual made $120,000 last year working from his house in Russia. That's over 4,000 hours of work, right? So very full time. Uh, Benjamin, you, you, you cater to something which I think some people had predicted would disappear, the sort of need for human contact in work. You know, that, that we, maybe we'd all be you know, happy to be at home and you know do our socializing via Facebook or whatever and that would be the substitute for the water cooler but effectively you know, you're finding and you're not alone in that that there are a whole series of uh, hubs and places like that where people do come together to work what is it that you find that people need why do they need it um, you know what are the things that are still in play in a sense where where, where the virtual the atomization might still win out over the gathering together? Uh, well, it's interesting because uh, what we're finding is that the, the movement is just growing at leaps and bounds. I mean, we opened our doors in September and we closed our membership in December. Uh, we were full in the blink of an eye. And we are now rushing to open two large spaces, one in New York and one in LA. And what's the deal? People pay to be there or they? Yes, um, it, it's a membership, it's a private membership model. Uh, it's private not to be elitist, but to make sure our membership doesn't skew in any, uh, widely in any one direction because um, we are a community that people need to be a part of and we need a very broad-based membership and a broad base of expertise in the room at any given moment because if you're a copywriter and you need an art director, we need to have that person in the room. So if everyone were a collaborative workspace, if everyone was an app developer, we would have a competitive workspace. We wouldn't have a collaborative one. Uh, so we work very hard to make sure that we have an interesting mix of people and we get up to 100 people at Grind every day. Um, but it has to be a, a, an interesting mix of those people so collaboration can happen. So what are you providing them? 
with? Um, well, our job is, is to provide them a, a frictionless workspace. We take all the mundane distractions out of their workday so they can sit and focus on doing the best work that they can. And oh, but what's, what are they, the mundane distractions? Oh, does a copy machine work? Uh, how do you get something printed? How do you, um, how do you book a conference room? Where do you sit? How do you plug in? How do you charge your iPhone? Um, those are. Are you helping them find work? We are helping them find work. Um, we are building community that they can actually connect to. Um, we help our members connect to each other in two ways. One, we do it manually. Um, me and my partners and my staff, we know what everyone's up to. We know what they're working on. And in our heads, if we can see that there's another member that they should be talking to, we make that introduction. Uh, on the other side, we have built uh, a private, for lack of a better term, a private Facebook uh, that is open only to our members. Everybody has a profile page. They can put up a picture. They can put their contact information, their likes, their dislikes. But more importantly, they can list the expertise that they can offer to our community and the expertise that they're looking for from our community. And it's searchable on that basis. segment of our website, you can see not only who's in the room at any given moment, who has checked in for the day, but you can see who else is a member of Grind who's not in the room that has the expertise that you need, and you can reach out to them, even though they're not sitting, at, sitting in the room at the same time. Because I was struck looking at, at, at some of your companies on um, ODESK, Gary, that there had been actually workforces that were forming um, you know, freelancers were coming together and actually forming companies and actually meeting sometimes getting offices in the Philippines or whatever where they would gather. And it, but it does seem that there is that okay. desire that many have to, um, to actually work with other people and, and what are the challenges in making that work? Yes, yeah, so we are in fact seeing that happen. Um, it's happening virtually, like, uh, so you know, a uh, designer uh, connects with a developer and now they're a team and they can go work for a client together. Uh, or, you know, we, we had a meetup in the Philippines and we sold out um, four 400 seat venues within an hour, you know, so that there's this desire for not only a client and a contractor to want to get together, and that happens all the time in our network where uh, one of our clients in Holland flew in their contractor from uh, from wherever they were, uh, somewhere in Asia, uh, and asked if they had to pay for that time. So we are seeing this desire for clients and contractors to get together. We're seeing clients connecting with clients. They want to learn from one another. They want to um, they, they want to leverage best practices, etc. And we're seeing contractors want to meet with contractors. So there is this desire for uh, some interconnectivity, not only online but also on premise. Um, so you know, I'd love to tap into Grind because I think, uh, in addition to be able to reach outside of the network of 500 members or whatever it is, which is pretty limited because it's only people who are going to be in New York. Why not the ability to reach into a network of 1.6 million people, right? So this expand out, and why shouldn't the clients there be able to tap into a bigger network regardless of location? That's that's what we're banking on. So Sarah, I'll come to you next. Yeah, one of the things that obviously traditional big companies did was they provided you with health care, they provided you with other benefits, pension benefits, they provided you with training, they um, protected you from uh, some of the abuses that freelancers have been subject to. Um, you know, what, as you look, we've talked about you know, the need for this new mutualization movement, but you know, certainly what do you see as being the challenges that society faces, whether through traditional politics or through other civil society means? You know, what, what, are we got to, what, what are the challenges that we face? What are the toughest ones? What, what are we able to answer and what are the ones that we're struggling to answer? I think the, the biggest, biggest, biggest problem is the episodic income, is that even if you're successful, your income goes up, it goes down, as every month your, your same bills come in, but the, the reaction is that freelancers or independent workers should fit into the mass production um, new deal. 
And actually what we're seeing is that people are just completely falling through the cracks and that we have to start thinking about new ways that we're going to make it so that people can work. Um, you know, one thing that I've been talking to a lot of um, CEOs in this space is that they're applying, they're trying to, to get funding and um, their, their VCs will say, well, what's the target market? And they'll say, oh, we don't know. And they think the freelancers, you must know. And we say, well, actually, we don't know because the federal government doesn't know. And you'll be surprised to know that the Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't count this workforce. They stopped counting it in 2005. And when you go and talk to them, they come up with this interesting way where they say, well, it's about 5% of the workforce. But then in other parts of their statistics, they say 18% are part-time and 10% are self-employed. And you say, I know like that sounds crazy, but that's like uh, you know 28% right there. So how are you saying five? And they say, well, it, it's kind of defined by whether you like it. So anyway, I think that we have to start thinking about coming together. You know, I think it would be great if everybody on this panel, you know, committed to letting letting the government know they need the numbers. So let's know what that that is. I would say another really important thing because freelancers union, you know, we're builders, we're creators. What we do is we we take our members and we create power in markets. We started our own insurance company. It's in its fourth year. It's profitable. It has a hundred million dollars in revenue. We now just were awarded a very big grant that came out of health reform uh, to set up distinct new uh, cooperatives in three states. It was an award of three hundred and forty million dollars. And what we think is really important is that we want to help freelancers and independent workers aggregate their own market power and start being able to use that power in the marketplace and that we don't have to just wait like woe is us this is all happening to us we actually have an ability to start making that transformation ourselves and not really have to wait for government or business and just as we're recognizing around here what's what's the most powerful asset of freelancers are freelancers and if you want to be a successful freelancer you build your network you manage your network you outsource to your network you do your friends favors you are actually the better person you are the better your network is it's about giving it's about love, it turns out to be pretty surprising. Um, and I bet you would, I'll bet you'd agree with me, the most successful people who get a lot of work are the ones who help out their friends, who give and give advice and are there and are present. And uh, it's going to turn out to be, I think, kind of an interesting thing. The corporate world, the message was dog eat dog some of the time. And I think this one is actually highly collaborative and I think more interesting. So I mean, let's imagine it's, it's sort of November of this year. and. President Santorum calls you up and says, come and, uh, come and head the, the Department of Labor for us. Let, well, let's not imagine that, actually. Let's imagine someone sensible calls you up and, and says, let's um, let, let, take over the Department of Labor. Um, I'd, you know, I'd what, like what, commerce, what, thanks. Commerce, would you? <laughs> come, and, come and join the government. What would the agenda What would the agenda be that you would set out? You know, I, I've been thinking a lot about it. I think it goes back to Teddy Roosevelt's vision for the environment that he started to have this awareness that we had land and beautiful land and it was the land for all our country. And I think that what we have to start saying is that there's this whole new way of working. We're gonna be bold and interesting and creative and innovative, which means we're gonna locate the, the Department of Commerce not in Washington, D.C. And we're going to move out those horrible buildings and we're going to make it flat. We're going to bring in ODESC and we're going to be setting up different networks because we're going to be collaborative. I think that the major thing that we have to think about is that our economy is so complicated, it can't just be so centralized in Washington that I believe we need a government and there's a role of government, but I also think it has to be really decentralized to be able to have local solutions. Um, so that's what I think. I mean, Gary, I mean, you mentioned Odesk. I mean, I, I guess President Obama at the moment probably doesn't regard Odesk as one of his shining examples of helping America because you're helping American jobs go to the Philippines or whatever. And so, I mean, what, what, what would your, if, you, if he invited you into the government, what would your agenda be? Well, first, let me disagree with the, the sentiment. Um, and the reason why is, uh, you know, we survey our small business customers. So these are just the companies that are getting work done on our platform. 80% of our users, and this is over, uh, this is a survey. The end was like 30,000 companies responding to this survey. And 80% of them told us that these jobs are lift, not shift. These are saying, these are jobs that wouldn't have existed locally. And in the Bay Area, I wouldn't hire 225,000, 225 
people because we couldn't afford to. I can't compete with Google and Zynga and Facebook, right, who are offering huge salaries and three square meals a day. So despite the fact that unemployment's at an all-time high, small businesses don't have the same resources. So our customers are telling us this is lift, not shift, okay? Second, 40% of the jobs on our site come from overseas. So only 60% are originate in the US. And of that 40%, a lot of those jobs are Australia and UK and uh, Germany and France, and they want US workers. So the, they're hiring onshore US workers because they want people with the situational fluency of the US. They want somebody who understands pop culture and, and the norms of business in the US. I spoke to a buyer in Tasmania. Don't even know where it is, somebody, somewhere by Australia, but he's got six people working for him in the United States, over $20 an hour, because he wants people here doing marketing and SEO work for him that have the US uh, uh, fluency, right? So uh, that's one, one side. Another is that we actually are working with Steve Case and, partner, and Startup America to empower entrepreneurs to get free work on ODES. Now it's acquisition for us, but we're trying to say, look America, to Sarah's point, get going. Here's free work on ODES. We don't care where the person is that you hire. What do you mean free work? Free work. Here's $100 free work credit. So you hire somebody at $20 an hour, it's five free hours of work. Surely there's some work that you could get done for free just to try it. Uh, and similarly, we're trying to help US workers by partnering with Julius Janikowski and the FCC uh, Julius's uh, mission is best and highest use of broadband globally, but first he's focused on the US, and best and highest use of broadband, well first and foremost it's access to the internet, because there's a lot of rural America that uh, doesn't have access, there's a lot of people that can't afford access, so they've got a whole program around making internet affordable for everybody, and then best and highest use, once you have access to it, well what are you going to do? Are you going to be on Facebook and YouTube all day? Or are you going to worry about education? And what's the other big initiative? Jobs. People need to work. So while $5 an hour may not seem like a lot, well, how about 10 bucks an hour from Ashtabula, Ohio, to an out of work uh, something? Or how about a, a former CAD CAM engineer in Flint, Michigan, that can't get a job today? So we're, we're trying to get America going by saying, look, free training via the FCC will train anybody on how to work via the internet, how to create a profile, how to apply for jobs, how to find the right jobs out of, a, we had 120,000 jobs available in the month of January alone. So we're doing our part to try and boost the economy from the worker side, here's how to, how to work, and from the company side, here's how to get access to talent that you can't compete and find with uh, locally. And is there one thing that if you were in the government you would do that would well, I think, we're, I think we're being short-sighted. I think everybody's looking at work 1.0 ways to try and solve the problem. They're saying, okay, how about we, we try and incent companies to move to Detroit? Because if we get companies to move there, then they can hire the people locally. But that's a really tough schlock. When you have to convince the company to move, then once the company moves there, uh, they've got to, you know, is the talent there? So we're thinking on premise. And we're thinking more H-1B visas. Let's, uh, let's uh, import more workers in. And we're, we're saying, no, 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 no. Leverage the internet. Leverage technology in order to get some portion of work done. And knowing that our customers are telling us it's lift, not shift, I think we're ignoring the internet. I think we're ignoring small businesses. I think, uh, I think there's a huge opportunity to get that message out. Uh, ben, do because uh, part of the problem with uh, you know, Create Jobs 1.0 is that uh, it, it is ignoring the, the future. Uh, the future is a global platform for business and work. Um, we haven't actually done a formal survey, but uh, probably 10% of the work that happens at Grind has some sort of international component. I mean, at this moment right now, we have one of our collaborative teams in London working on a project. Um, so the real challenge is to, for companies going forward, is to open themselves up to the new trend in business as opposed to trying to ignore it or fight the trend. Uh, you know, be more transparent, try to move in, in different ways, and try to open up a free flow of ideas and collaboration so these jobs can move from the United States to somewhere else and from somewhere else to the United States. John? 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I totally, I, I, I really agree too. I think that, um, you know, one of the issues is what Rashad brought up is, is many of the companies, we, we need to act, actually have a cognitive uh, shift of what a company or an organization is, right? It's been place-based by nature. Mm, sounds kind of loud. Um, thanks. Let me turn that one off. Uh, you know, we've defined ourselves as organizations as place-based. This is the office. This is our workforce. This is who we are. Here's our logo. Here's our brand. I think that's changing the very nature of what we do. It's more collaborative. It's more, let's come together to solve a problem and let's disband. Let's do that, you know, several times or once. It doesn't really matter, but let's find the best resources to go forward, whether those resources are human resources or technology resources, whatever those are. Yeah. Government with, job for you? Uh, uh, with anything respect, you would do to uh, improve how the government is relating to all this change? Um, well, with respect to work, I'm not in the government, but uh, my inclination is that I probably cut social benefits so people have an incentive to go back to work. Um, we, you know, we believe in alignment and human capital, and the people in, the, in our platform that do the best are those that you know have the best profiles and try the hardest and get the best feedback, and they always make the most money. Um, Okay, I'm going to go to questions in a second. I just, one, one last question. I was yeah, this week looking at uh, a new book called Abundance by Peter Diamandis, who is head of the X Prize and uh, um, the Singularity University, which is an incredibly optimistic book. But one of the risk factors that he highlights is that essentially robots are about to go big. Uh, and he raises the question of whether there will be any work for humans to do in the future as the robots take over. Um, I'm intrigued as to how, how any, whether any of you share that fear or whether, whether that, and, and, and in a sense, I think at some level there is truth to yeah, I'm, I'm, to I'm, I'm, I'm excited for it. I mean, we, we can relax all day and our work will be done. <laughs> Right, but how, how, what do we live on? <laughs> well, I mean, it's an interesting concept, and I look, do look forward to robots taking some of my mundane work out of my life. But you know, ideation is still a human uh, trait, and we have sort of the we've cornered the market on that. Um, and the robots won't be able to to help design or create the future. They can certainly execute the now, but. Um, Humans will still be needed. Sarah. You know, I think it's really true we're in a gig economy, and I think we keep trying to fill enough gigs that make up what we think of equals a career, you know, as if this is a mathematical equation. And so robots. And they've work, taken control of our mics. And, they, <laughs> and, and definitely our microphones, maybe. But um, so I just think that. that the way we define work is just going to be so profoundly different, and that I think is something that we're going In to have to figure out. Because I think that we're we're still think even on the way we're talking about it here, it's that this idea of the forty-hour work week, and there's like the cubicle, and then there's a career, and it has a linearity to it. And I think that we're starting to realize that that's a construct that's like only one hundred and fifty years old, and that if you look at history and you look at it much more broadly, really Really, what's going to be important is, do you have food? Do you have shelter? Do you have people that you love? And how do you put a life together? And work is just one part of it. And I think that sounds so crazy and radical, but I think that's just going to be the truth. But I mean, that, that posits a lot of political battles ahead, doesn't it, as to you know, who, who well, owns well, the, the truth is, I mean, of food and where we, where we are right now, and as you know, and the US, we're going to go into our elections. You know, look at the way we're dividing up the goodies right now, and I can assure you, you know, 99.8% probably don't think that it's being divided appropriately, and some part of the 0.2% probably agree too. John? I, my sense is the future is neither positively or negatively uh, how we think it might be. And I, I think back to the 60s and early 70s when everybody talked about flying cars and, you know, the four hour work. Work week, or sorry, the four-day work week, and how we're going to have all this this leisure time, right? That was going to be the big issue. Is how we're going to, what are we going to do with all this leisure time? We're going to have so much time on our hands. What else are we going to do besides work? Well, it hasn't quite turned out that way. And my sense is, certainly, that the technology, you know, technology and robots or whatever those those things that are on in the future, 
it's just going to be a shift of what we do as humans. There's going to be a shift in the kind of labor that we do. There's always going to be things for us to do. We, by nature, are creative as a species, and I think we'll continue to want to create and do new things and try to, you know, try to push our own creativity forward. Any robots seeking work on Odesk yet? Uh, uh, not yet, but a, 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 uh, not that you know of. Yeah, not that we know of. But um, uh, but there is a lot of robotic work, like work being done. But you know, I, I don't worry because somebody's got to design them, somebody's got to build them, somebody's got to manufacture them, somebody's got to service them, somebody's got to you know come up with the uses and define the processes. And there's still a lot of uh, jobs. But I do think that. Uh, there's some great equalizers out there, especially now. One of them is the internet, and the internet is going to profoundly change, continue to change. I don't even think we're at the knee of the curve of, of what's possible. Uh, you know, we'll do over a half a billion dollars of work through our platform this year, and we're not even at the chasm. As far as crossing the chasm, forget it, it's coming, right? The, so the internet, I think the economy is forcing not only companies to look for more cost-effective ways to get work done, and whether that be robots or whatever it is, com smart companies are looking for more innovative ways to work. And while we serve mostly small to medium businesses, big companies, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, HP, are all coming to ODES now and saying, what about us? Can we take advantage of this on-demand, flexible, global workforce? And so the economy, and then globalization, the fact that uh, you know, the world is truly flat, and you know, we believe that uh, companies should have access to the best talent regardless of where it lives, and we believe in meritocracy, that workers should be able to make the wage that they're worth in a global economy based on their skills and their knowledge, and uh, you know, uh, work is not a place. We think that, um, that, that, that uh, globalization will continue to change. Okay, let's take some questions. There's a lady in the middle there. Um, Mike's coming to you. Just say who you are as well. Hi there. Um, I have. Could you say who you are? So um, I'm Elizabeth, and I work for a company called Resource Pro. Um, I have two questions, but the first one is: You guys have talked a lot about the definition of work and how it's changing, but how do you think that the definition of productivity is changing? Um, anyone want to take that? Jay? I'd like to hear what you think. Um, <laughs> Well, you talked at the end about automation and how those things are going to change our ideas of productivity um, because we won't be the ones executing as much, but we will be the ones designing how it's executed. Um, that, that seems to me to be one of the components, but I'm not sure if you guys have given thought to any of the others. I mean, certainly if you look at the definition of a manufacturing job in the US now, I mean, a manufacturing job today is probably as high skilled and high tech a job as you could imagine. There's no real physical risk involved and uh, you know, the productivity is enormous compared to what you would see as a manufacturing job on an assembly line in China or something. But I, I don't know, does anyone, Jeff, you want to? So in our marketplace, we see a lot of work get done in a lot of locations at one time. Often people will deploy technology workers to remote branch offices or remote locations. To do that kind of work historically could take months or years to roll out new technology or to replace technology. With our marketplace today, uh, just in terms of productivity, we'll see clients go and upgrade technology at 2,000 locations in a week. That's kind of mind-boggling to an enterprise software company of the past to say, hey, we're going to upgrade technology in all these stores. How long is it going to take? They'll, they'll, they'll quote you years. But now we see our clients digesting large projects of work in weeks that may in the past have taken years. I mean, I think one of the interesting challenges that came up when I was researching my special report was that you know, we're getting this, again, this segmentation between work that's going to be incredibly stimulating, where if anything, the, the challenge is to be self-disciplined and not stress yourself out and maintain a healthy work-life balance. And then the ability for technology to basically define jobs in a way that are even more repetitive and mind-boggling than uh, has ever been the case in human history, and then find very desperate workers that are willing to do those jobs, where the challenges are you know, extremely different and, and where, I mean, the buzzword at the moment is gamification. Can you somehow you know, learn from World of Warcraft or something and embed it into the working process to make life a little more fun and uh, give you a few Pavlovian rewards for your ringing the bells or whatever? I don't know, John, what do you... And I, I think that's a great question on productivity. I had a really profound uh, conversation with, with a, a VC recently and he, he made his money in the first dot-com uh, boom. And his point of view was, you know, back then you had an idea and then you formed a company around that idea and you raised five to ten million dollars. 
it, because the technology was really expensive to build. And so you bet a lot on that technology, on that idea. But it was about all about forming a company around the idea. And he said, now as an investor, I don't think that way. I think about the idea and taking that $5 million and betting on you know, 100 of those ideas, or, or let's just say 50 ideas at $100,000 a piece, and then just letting one or two people develop those ideas long enough. And at the end of the day, I might have two or three companies that I'll fund in that second round. And, and his point of view was that, you know, in the short term, it was way more productive from a, from a horizontal standpoint. A lot more was getting done. But from a vertical standpoint, it took longer. It was much harder to get through those kind of gates to build an actual company. So it just it was a really interesting shift in my mind. Um, another question uh, right at the front here, Carl. So Gary, you talked about uh, lift, not, or lift not ship work, but you never explained what that is. Would you mind unpacking that for us? Yeah, so uh, four out of five of our small business customers um, say that these, are, these jobs are incremental. They, it wasn't a local job that they replaced a virtual worker with. The local job didn't exist. So they would not be able to hire somebody if not for a platform like this. How is that work getting done then before, before Odesk, how is that work? Uh, it wasn't, right? So it wasn't getting done, which which is the point, right? They they weren't able to get what they w get done what they needed to get done. They couldn't afford it. It wasn't an option. Now it is an option because they can get access to talent outside of the local area. So I'll give you a, a great example. So in the Bay Area, uh, graduate of Stanford, um, uh, technical degree, one hundred fifty thousand dollars with a fifty k signing bonus, right? We couldn't afford to hire that guy. We wanted to hire that guy, we couldn't afford it. He came in and said, look, Square, you know, the swipe reader is hiring me at this price. Are you, are you guys in or out? And we said, we're out, we can't afford it, right? So that, that it, we'll do without that resource, you know what I mean? Uh, so it's not that you had 10 local recs open and you couldn't fill them, so you turned to the internet. You had one local rec open, you couldn't fill the job. You said, is there a better way to do this? Well, you tried outsourcing, throwing it over the wall to the uh, where agency that you tried hire, hiring local um, um, local contingent talent, so a local staffing firm that that doesn't work, right? Because the talent doesn't exist, right? So we were able to hire 120 engineers all over the world, not outsourced. They work for us. They come to work for us every day. These are long-term jobs. They're working for the duration. They just happen to be doing it remotely. As you talk to your members, Sarah, I mean, is that your sense that they, uh, the work they're doing is incremental work, or are you seeing a lot of people who've had to become freelancers because uh, existing jobs were destroyed? Uh, uh, you know, I think it, it ranges. So you have people who, because wage, real wages have been declining for you know so many decades now, a lot of people who have full-time jobs are supplementing their income. People who are graduating from college, these are the jobs. And then in between jobs, people are freelancing. So it's kind of interesting. I think the distinctions are just getting to be less, less meaningful. There, there is one thing. I heard a statistic that said the learners of today, so today's students, by the time they're 40, will have uh, more than a dozen jobs. Right, and I haven't had a dozen jobs, and I'm over 40. You know what I mean? So that I think that, it, you know, to the point that it's becoming more of a gig economy. I think even W2, even careers, or not careers, but jobs are getting smaller. Um, not only freelance jobs, or shorter in duration. We got another question from the audience. So um, come and have another. Oh, Elizabeth's coming. Hi again. Hi again. Um, so that actually touches on another question that I had about the younger generation entering the workforce and starting to enter the workforce in large masses at this point. Um, and in the next couple of years, we'll see that increase. So how do you see that and kind of the, the values of that generation changing the work as well? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so across our platform, it's um, every age group. You know, we don't, we don't have any one particular area of dominance. I, I, I think there are cultural differences. I mean, I think definitely people that are coming out of school or I suppose high school, um, their, their expectation is that this is how it will be. I think that every sort of 15 or 25 years older, it, it's different. 
And I think the group that I notice that is having the hardest time are probably men who've been laid off over 50. And part of the reason is because their experience is, has been in, let's say, more of a traditional job that's less collaborative. And it's very hard to then be put into a situation where you have to start networking and trying new things. Um, and there's a lot of age discrimination out there, too. So it's very difficult. I would say the demographic today is they're online, they grew up online, they're looking for growth and development, they're looking for impact, uh, they're looking for more balance in their life. I have kids and they're already you know, thinking about, oh, when I'm in college, I'm going to go, I'm definitely going to study abroad, I'm going to travel, I'm going to be, so I think the, the expectations of this younger generation are suit well to this, right? To the fact that they're online, they grew up online, they get virtual, they get remote, they want balance. Um, they're 2 point. Benjamin? We'll serve everyone well to try to move away from considering uh, the freelance life as something that's temporary because it, it's, it's here for good. And, you know, at Grind, we have, you know, 30 year olds and 60 year olds all in the same room working, and they are they're there for the duration. Um, they're not in between jobs waiting for the, for the next. IBM to hire them. They are their own job, and they are professional, and they take it seriously, and that is their new profession. Freelance is now a profession. Yeah, so so um, our time is just pretty much up, but I just wanted to end with asking each panelist uh, to give a piece of advice. Um, if, you, if someone was to come to you today and say they were unemployed and, and thinking about how to go about building a career and this new world of work. What, what would be the piece of advice you, one piece of advice you'd give them? And Jeff, we'll start with you. Uh, make sure your skills are relevant. Any any tips on how? You, you know the um, the jobs that are in demand today are one of developers and high end technology resources. And if you don't have those skills and you want to work, learn those skills. Okay, Sarah. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> What else can I say? I, um, I'd say the way that you can make that manifest is by having a real network. And if you don't have a network, the best way to build one is to start giving, finding out what other people need and starting to help. It's sort of c counter to how people maybe often think. But um, your network is the whole way you're going to do well in this next economy. John? You know, I, I think there are a lot of folks that sit, especially when, when things are so disruptive and, and the marketplace has changed and, and is changing, they sit on the sidelines and talk the talk and spend a lot of time thinking about what they might do or how they might do it. And I, I just think the most important thing is to jump in and start, you know, run the run. I, I don't even think it's walk the walk. I think it's run the run now, right? It's really getting in and diving in, trying to figure it out for yourself and how, where the world's going. Because my sense is the reputation is, is, is no longer it's less and less about the company or the agency you work for um, or the organization, a lot more about the personal reputation and personal, you know, the, the ability to push that forward. So. Benjamin? Oh, my advice would be uh, figure out what you're passionate about and then hire yourself around that idea. And then do all the things about running the run and, <laughs> and networking and, and I mean, it's your business. You have to build it, you have to run it, but it really is critical that it is something that you love and you're passionate about. That's the, the fastest road to success. And lastly, Gary. Uh, I would get on uh, the internet on a platform like Odesk or any, any other. <laughs> and I would create an online profile and presence and start to build the reputation. We had 120,000 jobs available in the month of uh, January alone, many of those uh, unfilled. And so, is it going to be, uh, you know, your long-term uh, job, or is it something that you're super passionate about? Well, maybe not, but it's a start, and start to build that profile and go. Well, that, that does come down to the relevance of your skills, though. I mean, presumably, if you're someone with no computer skills, going to Odesk is not a great place to be. Or uh, uh, it actually, there's jobs available, right? So there's content moderation. Anybody can look at a, a photo and just determine if it's uh, violence or not violence, or this or not that, or uh, there's a lot of content creation. There's a lot of tagging. There's basic level skills that can be done via the internet that pay minimum wage that, you know, clients are looking for workers. They just don't want to house them in New York to do that work. I suppose my, my advice, other than read The Economist and... Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, well, it would be, uh, I mean, actually, Reid Hoffman of LinkedIn has written a book that's not great literature, but it's uh, very full of good advice called uh, Be Your Own, I think, Be the Startup of You, uh, which I think is also well worth anyone who's interested in thinking about the future of work uh, reading. Anyway, to, to wrap up, I, very, very good panel. Um, I, anyone who wants to follow me on Twitter, I'm Matt Bish, M A T T. B I S H. Anyone else on Twitter that wants to say their Twitter name? We're all up there. Great. We're Good. There. So, um, thank you very much for the panel, and uh, um, it was a great discussion. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.